Na het gesprek met George Soros zoeken we Bernard Connolly op. Hij heeft een kantoor op Fifth Avenue, waar hij opereert als analist en financieel consultant. Hij schrikt niet van een eventueel Duits vertrek uit de euro. Could that German bloc leave? Well, what would happen if it did? Um, the, the residual euro would be appropriately much weaker. It would reflect conditions in Spain, Italy, Portugal to a much greater extent than it does now. It would be much weaker. And that, of course, would mean that the northern countries would have significantly appreciated, uh, uh, unappreciated currencies compared with, uh, with today. But given that they've all got enormous current account surpluses, that is an appropriate thing for them to, to, to is appropriate for them to have significantly stronger currencies. Like logical. It's a logical thing for them to have. And it would certainly be very favorable for global adjustment. Connolly heeft een bijzonder verleden, weet ook Ewald Engelen. Connolly was betrokken bij de voorbereidingen voor de introductie van de euro en de Europese Monetaire Unie. Die eigenlijk al in een heel vroeg stadium zag dat dit een maakbaarheidsproject was met utopische trekken die zouden leiden tot grandioze mislukkingen. Daarover aan de bel getrokken heeft en vervolgens... Um, feitelijk uit zijn positie gewerkt is door een uh, eurocratische elite die van geen tegenspraak wilde horen. Well, the euro is an expression of a, a political ambition dressed up as an economic mechanism. And uh, 20 years ago, the propaganda produced by the European Commission, for instance, was that the, uh, the single currency would um, enable the countries of Europe to uh, maintain and to increase their prosperity, to uh, bring forth the full fruits of the, uh, of the single market, to increase stability, to uh, eliminate um, boom-busts, um, to make financial systems stronger, and generally to make everyone happier and nicer and better. Um, but, I, you know, it's hard to believe, it's hard for me to believe that anyone really ever thought that was the case. Or if they did think that was the case, they were pretty bad economists. It was always, I think, going to be um, uh, the reality that um, binding together uh, a set of very disparate countries with very different levels of um, productivity, of, uh, of standards of living, of economic development, in a single monetary policy, uh, a one-size-fits-no-one monetary policy, was going to create problems for them. Tuni legt Connolly de schuld nadrukkelijk bij de Europese politieke klasse die de euro in het leven riep. The banking crises and the sovereign debt crises are symptoms of the underlying problem of divergent competitiveness and of the, the bubbles created by the monetary union. So we had enormous bubbles. We had um, um, equity price bubbles, house price bubbles, v uh, very high rates of domestic spending in the, uh, the catch-up countries. Let's call them the peripheral countries as a shorthand. Um, both consumption and investment. And those booms were exacerbated, and those bubbles were made worse by the belief, um, quite deliberately inculcated by the euro area authorities, uh, that risk premiums had vanished in monetary union. That um, 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 if you got 4% interest in Greece, that was just as good as getting 4% interest in, in, in Germany. Of course, that was a nonsense. The problem is that if you don't have your own currency, what is going to happen? One possibility is that those deficits go on without any adjustment. If they do, then those countries are clearly insolvent. And Portugal, for instance, has an external debt ratio of something like 235% of GDP. They continue to get worse, and despite what the IMF says, will continue to get rapidly worse. The country is insolvent within monetary union. The same goes for for Greece, the same goes for Spain, arguably the same goes for France and Italy. Bernard Connolly schetst de scenario's. The extent of structural reform you need 
to get out of the mess that the, the countries are in is just, you know, unthinkable. Um, we did some calculations that suggested that, for instance, for Greece to uh, resolve its, its problems through structural reform would require a doubling, a 100% increase in productivity in Greece. Now, that would be nice if it happened, and we could all sit down and pray that it happens, but it's not going to. This is simply not feasible. So the German recognition that maybe we need a little bit more than austerity, maybe there's something not quite right here, doesn't really get you very far. The, the, what they need to realize is that basically they've got three, the four choices. Either they leave or someone else leaves, and there are all sorts of financial problems as a result of that. Well, there's a massive depreciation of the euro, which basically means the expropriation of German savers. Before, I suggested that to solve the problems of Greece or Spain, you'd have to have a euro at 30-something cents against the dollar. Standard economic models would suggest that the effect of that, and combined with how you get there, which basically means you know, suppressing all interest rates, would raise the German price level by 70%, 70% over five years. And with interest rates by construction at zero, that is an expropriation of 70% of all German savings. Well, can't happen. So the, or you have a transfer union, you pay 10% of GDP a year forever. That's not going to happen either. The, the, what the German government is shying away from is a recognition that there are no routes out of this mess that are not disastrous, but that the least disastrous route would be a breakup of the area, because that is completely contrary to all their political beliefs and ambitions for the past 60 years. In October. Volgens Bernard Connolly hebben alle mogelijke ontsnappingsroutes uit de huidige situatie eigenlijk alleen maar nadelen. If no adjustment means everyone goes bust, if um, adjustment through depression deflation means that all the peripheral countries go bust, so their creditors don't get anything anyway. If a transfer union is not possible without bankrupting Germany, what else? Could you have, uh, uh, could you improve the competitiveness of the peripheral countries through a massive depreciation of the euro? Well, again, in theory, yes, you could. But how big would that depreciation have to be? Well, some calculations we've done suggested in the case of uh, Greece, for instance, just using the dollar as a proxy for all other countries, the, the euro would have to go down to 34 cents against the US dollar. In the case of Spain, uh, the corresponding calculation is 38 cents. On the other side of the coin, for full equilibrium in Germany with um, uh, a, a current account position that didn't imply it was going to give, you know, is in effect giving money away forever, you would have to have the euro go to something like $2.35 against the, uh, uh, against, the, uh, against the dollar. So that span from 34 cents in Greece to $2.35 in Germany, I think is maybe the best single indication of how impossible it is for the euro area to, to work. So if there's no adjustment, lenders go nothing back. If you try to continue with the adjustment process, you still don't get anything back because your, your, your borrowers just come bust. So what else can happen? It's not obviously nonsense for Germany and the Netherlands to share a currency. It is obviously nonsense for Germany and Spain to share a currency. So it may, in some ways it, it makes sense for Germany and its satellites, if you forgive me for calling that in this context, were, were, to, were to leave. It would make sense for the southern countries. The big political problem about the German countries leaving is, what do you do about France? Where does France fit? Does it leave with the others? Whether it does or it doesn't, France is simply not going to be a giver in a transfer union. It will have to be a substantial taker. And it's really important because if you, if you try to add up the potential costs to you know, the one feasible giver, that's Germany, they come to something like 10% of German GDP every year, forever. 
And what, well, you know, and what is depends what sort of interest rate you choose to, to use, but the, the present value of that stream of 10% of GDP forever comes to something like 300% of German GDP or 7 trillion euro, something of that order. And 300% of GDP is bigger than the intended stream of reparations imposed on Germany in the Versailles Treaty. It's very hard to see any way out. I, I'm frankly, I'm scared. There is a, a permanent bloc whose interests, when taken together, have produced a system whose effects are evil. I'm, I'm feel quite justified in, in saying that. I think one has to attribute a degree of culpability to that. Now, we all, we all act in our self-interest to a greater or a lesser extent. But I think one can't have a blind spot. One can't look at what is happening in the southern countries and say, oh, well, you know, you can't make omelettes without breaking eggs. I think that expression is uh, a, a, an expression of <sighs> moral inversion, maybe moral perversion. Uh, but that is the attitude of the European authorities. You can't make an omelette without breaking eggs. The eggs are millions of people in the southern countries. The omelette is, well, you know, we get to run the world.